All right. So we're, we've been talking about faith for the last three Sundays. And you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, um, it's that love passage, right? Where it talks about um, love. I'll just keep it simple. But at the end of, toward the end of it at 13, 13, it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so we began talking about faith, the different aspects of faith, faith being a gift of God, walking in faith, um, our role in, in, in building up faith and continuing to walk in it, all of those things. And today we're going to look at hope. And uh, Cynthia is going to take us to Romans 15, 13. And this is really where we're going to work out of. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound, or another translation would be overflow, in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going to, to work out of on this, um, working deep, getting deeper into the idea of hope. You know, this verse in Romans 13 is set in the context of, of um, self, well, self denial of building up your neighbor of seeing others as better as, as than yourself in fact it, it even talks about that christ is our example in this that he himself humbled himself right and made himself less and came as a servant of many and how he uh, led that example in our lives of how to serve one another in love to put others first and it also talks about um, accepting one another as Christ accepted us, it says, then accept one another. And there's a lot of lessons there, but one of those is that we, um, God has made us individually unique, and we shouldn't try to change each other, <laughs> right? It doesn't work. Um, and, and so we accept each other's personalities, our quirks, our different behaviors, our idiosyncrasies, all of that. And, and uh, even we fall in love with those. As a husband and wife, you, 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 you're, I think we would... I don't, well, one of us is going to find out someday because unless we go together in a fiery crash, which we're praying for, because neither, <laughs> neither, of, us, neither of us wants to be alone. <laughs> so I know it sounds crazy, but you understand? All right. Um, but if one of us is left alone, I think the thing that we will look to, and, and maybe some have experienced this, and I'm sorry if you have, is the, the thing that maybe annoyed us through their, their life of our spouse is the thing we might miss the most in some ways, right? That reminds us of them. And so, um, so those, those differences in our personality, that uniqueness, God loves that, he's made that. And, and it says in Romans, embrace that in each other. That's just a side thing. That's not really where we're going. Uh, you know, hope from a bigger biblical definition is a strong and confident expectation. The original definition, if you go back, a strong and confident expectation. The modern version, a little less rippy, the feeling that what I want, so whatever I want, my hope is in whatever I want, that will happen. Instead of a strong and confident expectation focused on God. Right, and that's the difference between the biblical definition, the original real sense of it, and, and now where it's more based on feelings and emotions and what I want, my hope and what I want. So why does this first say Yahweh is the God of hope? Well, it's interesting because it's a statement. It's a statement about his very nature, his character, his personhood, about who he is. He is, it doesn't say, may the God of hope, or may the hope of God, pardon me. It says, the God of hope, right? He is this. The I am is this. He's good. He's holy. He's incapable of, of sin or lying or any of that, right? There is no darkness in him. It says, only light. And so we can put our trust in him. We are secure in him. And also only in him is there a hope of forgiveness, a hope of eternal life. And, and uh, maybe Evans is going to know this song. Maybe he's going to sing it for us some, sometime. Um, 
I think it's called Shifting Sand, a hymn. Do you know, anybody know when it was written or who wrote it? No? Yeah? I'm gonna read it for you. Cause I'm so new to the faith that I actually watched it in a movie with, um, what's his name? This, anyway, famous singer. I don't remember the name of the movie either. <laughs> my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come and trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, in him my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. In he then is all my hope and stay. So I just thought that I just that song I, I really love. Evan now is going to be looking into it for me. <laughs> you know, our hope is in the factual truth, this strong and confident expectation that Jesus is able to save us by his selfless act on the cross. <clears throat> that God is holy, he is righteous. And his word is reliable and true, and we can put our full weight on it, right? We can stand on it. I mean, what other God brings such joy and, 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 and hope into the lives of his people? Like, think about it. If you look back at the history of, of gods, doing the air quotes, um, because there are no other. Um, but when you look back at people and following gods and worshiping other gods, these were normally very cruel gods, right? They, if you go to sac yourself, your, your, sacrifice your baby to Baal in order to receive something or to receive peace or a harvest, all right, well, there's no joy and peace on that. So most gods had that kind of, there was a fear of them, not this healthy, this healthy, awesome, righteous fear that we, you know, this awe that we have of, of, of Yahweh unhealthy fear there is no joy or, or peace in these gods and you know what we desperately need hope we need hope to carry on we need hope in this world we need that confident expectation of something greater we really do something better to come so all of us need to hope in something um even people who don't believe in god they hope in something they hope in their friends or their family or their spouse, usually people is what they place their hope in. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, or when necessary, we hope in professionals or tradesmen. So we might put our hope in the doctor or a dentist or a lawyer. All of those things seem to require pain that we're going through. Even lawyers, it's very painful. But we, we put some hope in them that they're going to help us, right? Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about since I grew up as a, fin as a finishing carpenter, and that was a lot of my life. You know, I, I think of from things from a more of a tradesman's perspective. So, you know, when the plumbing bursts in your house, you call a plumber and, and you have some hope that they can help you before everything becomes a mess, right? How many of you have uh, had a, hired a contractor and built a house from new? Yeah, enough of you. You're putting your hope in that contractor that he's a good person, that he knows what he's doing, that he's going to give you good advice, that things are going to go well. Does it always turn out well? <laughs> you hope it does, um, but it doesn't always. Uh, and I, I just say that because my dad was a contractor and he was super ethical and he did his best. But you can't please everyone and not everything goes right and think problems happen. And I, I know horror, horror stories from people who have had their houses built and it was the worst experience of their life, just about destroyed their marriage. So not much hope there. And you know what? That's inevitable, right? Because people are fallible. We make mistakes. 
mistakes we and those of those who um and some who know god unfortunately but those who don't know god have that moral imperative of service in doing what is good and right and doing their best always and so it's it's not like the holy and righteous god who we can put our hope in and know and know that that hope is secure that we won't be disappointed now we may not always like the answers <laughs> that God gives us or the ways that he draw, you know, takes us. And we may not understand all of that sometimes. We, we not, may not get why he's taking us to a certain place or why we're not getting the answer we want. But our hope in him is never misplaced. And I think that's what's really important for us to understand. It can't be misplaced. He can't. How do I put it? Well, he can't disappoint us. He can't. Right? And if we're disappointed, it's not because of him. It's, it's something within us, right? It's a misunderstanding. It's our own baggage. It's our own. Do you remember Hebrews 11, 1? It's the definition of faith. We've, we've talked about it many times. That now faith is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance of, about what we, what we do not see. And kind of the, the, the strong definition of faith. So faith is really trusting in that that God is, is, is real, that he's true, um, that the things we truly hope for in God are, are real, right? That we, we have our confidence in these things, um, that we believe that the promises of God will happen, that we, we say we stand on those promises. We, we, we don't just accept them, but we, we have a confidence in them, okay? It's this um, idea of a confident expectation. And the more we get to know the Lord and the more that we've seen him help us in our life and, and, and the more we gain that confident expectation that the Lord is going to help us, that he's going to watch over us. And our hope is in Jesus Christ as God. And we walk in faith with the assurance, right? With the absolute assurance that this hope is not misplaced. That this is where we place our hope, not in men, and not in other people, not in other things, but in, in, in the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the next verse in, in Romans here says that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. He's going to fill you. And the reference is, is, is completely full. Todo lleno. <laughs> right to the top. He's going to fill you up with joy and peace in believing. Um, you know, just as God gives us with faith, and we see that in Ephesians 2, it's talked about that, that God gifts us with faith and helps us to walk in it. And he does that through even extremely difficult circumstances. In fact, that's when our faith really, really needs to be built up and, and really needs support. Um, and so too, we read, in, as we see in this passage, that the Holy Spirit um, fills us with this inexplicable joy and peace. And it's very interesting to me. I, have you, I mean, I've been in situations where I've been really sad and yet over loss or under something else, but there's this profound peace and even a sense of joy in the Lord in the midst of that. And I've never experienced that before I came to know the Lord, that this profound sense of joy and peace in the midst of sorrow how, how is that possible well it's only possible when you're in the lord by the work of the holy spirit so we don't lose hope we don't despair but we continue to hope in the one who saves us and who says promises us eternal life and that is that blessed hope romans 5 says that Hope does not put us to shame. God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That hope has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So we've got overflow, uh, overflowing in hope, abounding in hope, hope being poured into us, being filled. Titus 2, 11 to 13 speaks about um, how we're supposed to live godly and upright lives as we await, await the return of Jesus Christ, our blessed hope, it says, our blessed hope. And when we say that, 
uh, as believers, when we say our blessed hope, we know what that means, right? We know that this is our expectant desire, waiting for Christ to return and redeem all things. And that moment when we're going to meet the king again, when we're going to have this resurrected body, when Gary is going to have no more pain and see 2020 <laughs> and dance with the Lord. Because I know you're a good dancer, Gary. <laughs> he says, not so much. <laughs> and so this is our blessed hope, right? This is what we, we look to and we hope for. Um, now, that doesn't mean we don't hope in this life because he says, now this is eternal life. Now, right? We, Christ in us, the Holy Spirit within us, indwelling us, guiding us, teaching us, empowering us now in this life helps us to have hope, helps us to go forward. And you know what? The other thing is we don't, um, because we understand the promise of eternal life, we don't grieve as those without hope. You remember that, that passage from, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that, that we are, as believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. It doesn't say we don't grieve. We grieve with hope. We, we grieve still, but with knowledge, with a certainty that our loved one who was in Christ is present with the Lord, absent from the earth, Paul says, but he'll be is present with the Lord and that someday we will be too. And then we will all um, come together. What did that song say? We all meet together on something short. We're going to sing that at the end, aren't we? Yeah, on God's celestial shore. All right, you know, those who don't know Jesus don't have such hope or comfort. You know, they really, they really don't have much hope beyond this life, right? If you don't believe there is something afterwards, if you don't believe there is a God and an eternal life and, and something profound to heaven, then, it's, then you just, you're just living for the now, living in this life, no expectation of, of something beyond that. And the scriptures tell us that this life is really short, right? This is but a blink of an eye in so many ways. Um, now, it doesn't seem like that to us now. And especially it doesn't seem like that when we're struggling and we're suffering. There's a, there's a fundamental difference between a follower of Jesus of Christ and the rest of the world. And that is Christ is our blessed hope and gives us hope in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of all of those problems so our, ulti our, our, our hope ultimately rests in the promise of Father God who does not change or lie and cannot do so. He, you know, uh, he can't lie to save his life. It's the saying it shouldn't apply to him, but I guess, you know, I actually know some people like that and I, I'm so blessed by them that they just, it's almost, it seems impossible for them to lie. I'm like, wow, I don't know how that happened because, uh, that's pretty impressive. But there's people like that are so morally grounded, so um, deeply, I don't know, what the Lord's done in their life and their personality, they just can't lie to save their life. And it's a beautiful thing. You know. All right, so why does it say that God fills us with joy and peace to believe? And why does he do that? Why would we be filled with joy and peace in believing? And the passage tells us that it's so we will abound or overflow with hope. And it says that's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he has a purpose in filling us with joy and peace and believing so that we will abound in hope, not just hope a little bit, but abound, overflow with hope. So, The God of hope, it says, wants us, his children, to overflow with hope. And so that's something I think we really need to understand. The God of hope, the, the person, the personhood of God, his very nature, his character, his being, is a God of hope, right? A God who, man, that's a tough word sometimes to explain that, but who looks forward to what is good and right, um, looks forward to 
to something better. Optimistic, you know, an optimism, an, an optimistic. And he, so why is that? Well, because he loves us. And so he wants us to abound in hope. So the God of hope says, I don't want you just to hope a little bit. I want you to abound in hope. I want you to overflow in hope. It's connecting um, with his very character and his nature. And that happens to us as we uh, believe in Jesus Christ, as we proclaim him as our Lord and Savior. And then as the Holy Spirit, the passage tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. That's one of the gifts that it gives us, the gift of faith and the ability to abound and overflow in hope. And it's what the Lord desires in our lives. I, I truly believe that the Father wants us to experience and live out righteousness as it has been passed down or imbued is the word, right? Then Christ imbues us with his righteousness. He passes it on to us. He makes us righteous by his shed blood. And so the hope of God is passed on to us as well. So he wants his children to know and walk in the joy and, and the peace that accompanies this relationship with him, this gross relationship that Christ Jesus has brought us into. And so, but how do we do this? Because it's one thing for the Holy Spirit, right, to, to put this in our lives, but what do we do? How do we do this? How do we abound in hope when we can live in a world that's really cruel, really harsh, really painful, where there's loss and suffering and, and even more so? And, and, you know, if you go through the scriptures, the, the Lord tells us that as we follow him, we will face trials and tribulation and suffering. We will be mocked. We will be scorned. We will be on and on and on, right? Um, his promise isn't follow me and everything's going to go great and nobody's going to bother you and you're going to be so blessed in your life in the world. No, you're going to be blessed in your life in him and in relationship with each other. Um, but the world is a harsh place because we are um, in the world, but we're not of the world, right? And, and the scripture says, if you have the love of the world in you, you don't have the love of the father in you, if you love the world. And so there's this dynamic that's going on that we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of it in many ways. And, and so it's hard, but there's only one way this can happen, that we can have this abounding hope in the midst of this, and it's because God's doing it. We cannot manifest it by our own will, our own being. It has to be from the power of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit. You think of the, the story of the, when Jesus is talking about the rich man and the camel. You remember that? How he says, because, you know, he says how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, that it's easier for a camel to fit through an eye of a needle. And, and one of those uh, historical references is coming to the, the gate at night and the large gate, the passage gate for the, the, everyone coming in is closed and there's just a little tiny little door opening. And, and one of the references to that, there's many different ideas about the camel and the eye of the needle is that you have to take all the packs off the camel and try to get it on its knees and to crawl through this little doorway and how difficult that is. Um, but it's interesting because the disciples just look at Jesus and go, what are we gonna, what? there's no hope for us then, Lord. They literally say, are saying, well, then there's no hope. And he says, Yes, he says, with, with you, this is not possible. With God, all things are possible. And so God makes the impossible possible, even in hope, even filling us with hope, joy, and peace in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of struggle. But the Holy Spirit empowers us super, supernaturally beyond our understanding and ability. That's how it works. God does not leave us alone. We're not on our own. He's helping us constantly so that even in times of trouble, we can be filled with joy and peace. And uh, right away then, for me, I go back to James, not you, James, James in the, in the Bible, uh, James 1 verse 2, right in the beginning, right? And right away, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, 
whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? You know, just struggle with that. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Okay, what's he saying? How does he? I mean, the only way we can do this is by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, right? Do this on our own. It's not possible. Um, it's interesting because uh, the Apostle Paul talks about it as well in Romans. And they both say that that these these trials, right, bring about perseverance, and that perseverance builds character, and that even and then after that even builds more hope. And so that the Lord even uh, in this is using these trials and these tribulations to mature us, to strengthen our faith, to make us more able to minister to others in their suffering. Right, so he even out of this, he the, out of the the hard and difficult things, the Lord uses something good, and uses us to minister to others if we're willing, and so he has a purpose in all of these things. You know, hardship, trials, loss—they're going to do two things, right? They're either going to cause us to turn toward Jesus or away from Him. This is this is what we have. We. We are turned away from the Lord and we, we get angry and reject God and God, why would you do this to me? Why would you allow this in my life? Um, all of those things. Oh, we put more hope in him, more faith in him. We lean on him, right? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all things, right? Trust in the Lord, lean on God. And so these things, these troubles, these hardships, these losses should draw us closer to Jesus Christ. And as we draw closer to him, he ministers into our hearts and brings us more hope, more peace, more joy. And you know what? The, the real power here is that our hope is not misplaced. Because when it's placed in God, in Father God, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, it can't be misplaced because he is the God of hope. He is the God of hope helps us now and, and you know he's our, our eternal helper and so we just we have this belief in, in Jesus Christ that is is profound right like how do you even explain that you can't do it on your own you can't believe in him by your own logic by your understanding he comes into your life and, and draws you close and reveals himself to you and then we we believe in him because we see the profound truth of Jesus Christ and it's, it's amazing to me that the Father's desire is that we live this life with overflowing and abundant hope. We don't despair. We don't give up, right? But we abound in hope. And one of the main reasons for that is because we believe in the promise that Christ will return, that he is coming back. And that we, as his children, are going to be in his kingdom, in his presence. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing promise and hope. But it's more than that. It's a truth. It's a reality. So we hope on the fact of this truth. And that's where we are.